Over the past three years, me and my team have worked on thousands of different cold email campaigns with hundreds of different companies. We have generated tens of millions of dollars through those companies. And there is this one simple thing that the top 1% of cold email copywriters, B2B growth marketers, agency owners, whoever, do every single time to absolutely blow their campaigns out of the water and predictably make them perform extremely well. And uh, a lot of people just miss this. So today we're gonna be doing a presentation on this exact topic. We're gonna be doing a presentation or a video for B2B growth marketers and agency owners on how to write better cold emails than 99% of people using a concept called the theory of mind. And in a second, all of that is going to make sense. It's a human behavioral concept from psychology that I like to use a lot. So yeah, if you do this right, you're gonna be able to crush absolutely amazing campaigns. And this is not just something, some cold email beginner level stuff. Like we work in our mastermind agent velocity.io, like here's the logo, pretty, do pretty dope. Like we inside there have like some of the best cold email marketers out there, you know, like the people who get hired by the big, huge, massive brands who charge $10,000, $15,000 a month to work with them. Like there are some crazy cold email copywriters there. And even these people at times make this mistake of not doing this one thing and uh, it is costing them a lot of money. So if you're an agency owner, a B2B growth marketer, you just use cold email for anything in your life or if you just make money from doing cold email campaigns, this is going to be extremely, extremely, extremely useful for you. Uh, and yeah, it's gonna be great. So to get into it, 99% of agency owners, marketers and cold email copywriters believe that in order for them to write better cold email campaigns and book more meetings and just have better performance, they have to become better quote unquote copywriters. And in a way, yeah, this is 100% true, but not in the way that they think. Because people think that copywriting is all about fancy hooks, clever call to actions and romantic writing patterns that you see on old school ads. And this has also gotten way more popular in the last 12 months since people for some reason seem to be hyper obsessed with the latest technology and tactics in cold outreach over the fundamental marketing principles that always apply. Like people are so obsessed about like clay tables and AI personalization and API scrapers and RS feeds and, and all that stuff. Like yeah, 100% that stuff is useful, but that those tactical and technological things on the surface can never beat the deeply rooted human behavior based marketing principles that all the big marketing campaigns are built upon. So they see some old school direct response ad and they think, wow, this guy is an amazing copywriter. So they see an old school ad like this from an old newspaper or maybe even from like a funnel that is currently running with these crazy headlines and, and crazy bullet points and warnings and all these crazy things from, from landing pages and sales letters that make hundreds of millions of dollars. And they think, damn, this guy, this guy's a G. Like if I could just write copy like this, I would, I would also have like super high performing campaigns. I would be a really good cold email copywriter. But actually, the reason why the good copywriters are so fucking good isn't their ability to write the words on a page. Like the ability, yeah, of course, like a headline has a big impact, etc. But the reason why they are able to write these good headlines or these good sales letters or good cold email campaigns isn't because they can write the actual words on the page. It's their ability to understand who they are writing to. And in this video, we'll go over how to figure out exactly who we are writing to and what they need to hear in order to convert. Because everyone has their own agenda, their own needs, things that matter to them. If you can figure those things out, you're like golden. So when you learn how to do this, you'll never have to rely on templates, luck or brainless A-B testing to get a campaign to work. You don't need to like be throwing shit at the wall and just hoping someone sticks. Uh, since you're pretty much reading the minds of your prospects and giving them the exact information they need. Also, you'll be able to use this exact process to create amazing offers. Like this is really, really good for creating really good high converting offers, video sales letters, or just have super high closing rates on sales calls. See, since you have such an in-depth understanding of what your prospect needs and how to communicate it. So it's really powerful. And to also demonstrate the power of this, uh, I'm gonna first give you an example to demonstrate further. So imagine you wanna go to a Taylor Swift concert, but you don't wanna go there alone, which is completely understandable. So you plan to ask your friend to come with you. But you know it's going to be a really hard sell, since first of all, your friend doesn't like Taylor Swift. And second of all, the tickets are like 1.2K and your friend is stingy as fuck. And this actually blew my mind. I've never looked at Taylor Swift tickets online, but like they're like 1K, so they must be a pretty, pretty great concerts. So naturally the big mistake most people would make is that you go to your friend 
and they start pitching them on how amazing Taylor Swift is. Like the cool venue, the amazing atmosphere, the amazing songs, the dances, blah, 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 blah. Stuff that they do not care about. Because remember, they don't like Taylor Swift. No matter how much you hype up the event, your friend won't care enough to dish out 1.1k for a ticket, you know? Like, why would they? They could spend that money on something they actually like and care about. A new phone, a new laptop, a vacation. On top of the money, they have to travel to another city, stay in a hotel, wait in super long lines, and invest a lot of time and energy to get to the show. The desire isn't strong enough to justify the energy and money investment they have to make. But if you're not some average corporate LinkedIn sales expert geek, <laughs> but an actual stud who knows why people do things, you approach your approach most likely would be something like this. First, so instead of just going out there and like being like, ah, oh, fucking, I need to get, I need to get my friend to go to this Taylor Swift ticket. I'm just gonna hype up Taylor Swift, but it's not gonna work because you have to hype it up like crazy and make all these crazy bold claims and all these things, and for them to spend one over one k on a ticket and and go through the effort, etc. So if you're an absolute stud and not some corporate geek, first you map out what are the deep desires or problems your friend is actually looking to solve. For his, for his in his life. For example, maybe you know that your friend has been a single for a while and is feeling lonely because of it. He's lonely, you know, doesn't have a girlfriend. Second, you figure out what kind of beliefs your friend has around the topic of dating and finding his dream girlfriend. Maybe he doesn't like online dating, maybe whatever, 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 you know? And third, you <clears throat> Sorry, you tailor your pitch around these desires and beliefs to showcase what's in it for them, what's in it for your friend, why should they care about it, and why their desired outcome is worth more than the money, or why the desired outcome is worth more than the money and energy they have to invest in uh, to come to the show with you. Like you have to understand that in every single sales scenario or transaction, like there always has to be the desired outcome or the problem they solve has to be more valuable than the energy and money they have to invest. And not just the money, like people might have the money, but they might not have the time. Like let's say you are selling a CRM, like changing a CRM, if you have a big sales team or big companies, like it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and there's a lot of things that go wrong. So your desired outcome has to always outweigh the in investment of money and energy. So you, you have to figure out like, okay, what kind of a desired outcome could my friend get here, which would outweigh the 1K ticket and the standing in long lines and staying in a hotel and traveling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of going to your friend and saying, yo, bro, let's go to Taylor Swift concert next month in Miami. It's going to be totally sick. She's like the best artist in the world. The Miami Gardens is such a sick venue. The tickets are a bit over 1K, but it's totally worth it because it's such a cool experience. Remember, your friend doesn't care. He doesn't like Taylor Swift. They don't care. But instead of doing this, you go and you say, man, I know Taylor Swift isn't really your thing and 1.2K is in pocket chase, but think about it. Most of the people going to that concert will be 18, 18 to 25 year old girls. One of our concert, concerts had almost 100,000 people. It's an amazing place to find a girlfriend since people come in excited as hell to have a good time and meet new people. You'll also have the perfect icebreaker since you already have the natural connection of being at the concert. As a bonus, almost all of our songs are about love and relationship, <laughs> relationships, so you know for a fact that the people, what people have in their minds at the concert. So yeah, worst case scenario, you get a few dates that don't turn into anything and we get an amazing memory of the night, funny memories, Whatever, best case scenario, you'll find the love of your life that you end up spending the rest of your life with. You can always spend the money and energy on random dates, date, dates, nights at the clubs or Tinder gold, or you can stack the odds in your favor and invest in one night that can easily change the rest of your life. So instead of saying like hyping up Taylor Swift and talking about how amazing the event is it in itself, you take their deepest problem or their biggest desire right now, which is finding a girlfriend and you position the event as something that could get him there. And like you show them why, it, like the, the people there are like the perfect target audience. It's like the vibe is perfect, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like you'll get a bunch of dates. You might, be fi might find someone. And obviously finding a life partner or solving the deeply rooted issue of being lonely is for most people worth more than the 1.2K, you know? It's like uh, instead of trying to sell the Taylor Swift ticket, you sell a solution to the problem of loneliness and being single. So as you can see, and of course, like this is a pretty shit example. I just wrote it up. Uh, of course, it would sound really robotic if you talk, talk like this, uh, but you get the point, you know? 
As you can see, because you approached the situation from the perspective of your friend's desires, problems, and beliefs, the pitch was instantly 100 times more powerful. And this is exactly what your strategy with cold email copywriting should be as well. A lot of people, they just take something like the Taylor Swift event, or they take some service or product, whatever, and they just try to hype it up how fucking cool it is, and how good it is, and how cheap it is, and etc, etc, etc. But they don't take into consideration the actual deep pains and desires and problems and limiting beliefs the audience actually has. Because if you took those things into desire, like uh, those things into consideration, you would might maybe realize, damn, they don't care about any of this stuff that I said, you know. So it's really powerful. You have to understand why your prospect should give a fuck. If you nail that down, you'll be able to write super resonant copy to your prospects without any templates, any fancy copywriting tricks, or uncertainty if the campaign is going to perform or not. So, how do we actually do this? To do this in a predictable and accurate way, we first have to understand the concept of theory of mind. And uh, uh, it's also called Tom. Mm <clears throat> so, theory of mind is the ability to understand that other people have their own thoughts, beliefs, and desires and emotions, which can be different from ours. Really simple, we usually learn this at a really early age. It allows, to, allows us to put ourselves in someone else's shoes so we can anticipate what they might be thinking or feeling in a given situation. In copywriting, theory of mind is an extremely powerful and necessary tool. It, enable, it enables us to create messages that truly resonate with our audience. Tom lets you em emphasize with your audience struggles and desires so you can create content or create copy or create campaign that speaks directly to their needs. Instead of random generic claims, you can offer specific solutions that match what they are actually trying to achieve. So instead of saying, Taylor Swift is the best artist in the world, you say, hey bro, you can find a girlfriend here. It also builds trust and rapport. People want to feel understood when you show that you genuinely get where they're coming from. It builds trust. You can anticipate their, con uh, their uh, concerns and address them, making it easier for them to trust you and your offer. Because you show them, hey, I understand what you're going through. I understand your problem, I understand your desire. And that positions you automatically as an expert or as an authority figure in the niche. Because like, okay, this guy actually has to know what he's talking about to understand this, you know? So if you know they're worried about the cost, for example, you can address that concern up front and provide reassurance. It shows that you understand and care which positions you as an authority. Of course, to be able to do any of these things, we'll have to have a deep understanding of the market we are selling to. In the Taylor Swift example, if you've known your friend your, for years, you'll probably know their desires, their fears, their beliefs, and goals pretty well. You know that they want a relationship. You know they are feeling lonely because they have told you. But from a business standpoint, this isn't always the case. Of course, if you've been in the same niche for years, you'll probably have a great understanding of a lot of these things automatically. But if you haven't consciously focused on gathering this information, it's still probably pretty surface level. So the process for this is super simple. It's four steps. First, you talk to the market and gather information. Second, you extract the right information from your conversations and research. Third, you implement it to your campaigns. And fourth, you iterate it based on new feedback and uh, new insights. And I'm going to show you how to do all of these things. So yeah, super cool. So first thing is going to be talking to the market and gathering information. When it comes to talking to the market, there are a lot of different methods to do this. You can talk to your customers, to other people in the market, you can read forums, talk in communities, or ask ChatGPT. Important here is to understand is the fact that not all information is equal. People have different biases based on who they talk to. For example, if you ask your best friend of 10 years what's their biggest goal in life, they'll probably give you a detailed, honest answer explaining exactly what they want to do, what kind of a family they want to build, etc. Like deep shit, you know, straight from their heart. Like, yeah, I want to have a wife, I want to have kids, I want to live here, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to be fulfilled, blah, 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 blah. But if your friend is asked the same question in front of a different crowd, for example, in a job interview, they'll give a different answer because of their bias in that given situation. If in a job interview, uh, they get asked, what's your biggest goal in life? In most, like, most certain scenarios, they're going to say, yeah, I want to work for a great company and blah, 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 blah. You know, like the goal is going to change or the information they give is going to change based on the given situation, you know? Or let's say it's in front of a big crowd or at a date or whatever, you know, like some like you're in front of a big classroom and in front of like 100 people, you have to tell them what's your biggest goal. You're not going to tell them the most deepest desires of your life in most cases, because like that's vulnerable information. You don't want to open up to these random people. So you're going to say something else. And this also happens when doing market research. 
And this is why I've also mapped out the levels of market reachers down below. And these are based on my own experience of doing this. So there are pretty much five levels of market research. Like you could have more or less, but these are pretty much the main five that I see. And higher on the triangle is better and lower on the triangle is worse. So the number one best way to do market research is talking to customers, doing customer interviews, talking to clients, customers, people who are already giving you money or giving your client money if you're doing this for a client, but talking to someone who's already giving them money. Second thing, and I'm going to talk about, about this in a bit, but the second way is doing prospect interviews. So pretty much talking to people who are not giving you money, but could be giving you money. They're like in the market, they're similar type of companies, etc. Third, network interviews. So talking to people who you have in the same industry in your network, you know, like maybe you're working in the IT niche and you know some guys in IT, like they might have some insights, but once again, most likely they're not from the exact perfect companies or they're not the exact job title, whatever, whatever. Um, for it, forums and communities, so going in the forums, going in the community, seeing what people talk about there. Like this can work really well if the quality of the community is really good and the culture inside there is great. Like a great example of this, we had this one guy inside our mastermind AV and uh, he was going in the logistics industry. And he asked me, hey, is logistics industry good? I am saying, yeah, probably, like there's a lot of money in there, but I don't know anything about the logistics industry. So you'll have to do your own research. So what he did, yeah, he did some prospect interviews, he did network interviews because he had people in the network, but he also went and he bought a course on scaling a logistics company and he joined a, com uh, a community that came with the course. And in this co community, there was hundreds of people looking to scale a logistics company and he was doing B2B lead generation. So he just literally like talked to people there and asked like, uh, like saw what people were struggling with, like what kind of metrics they were measuring, what kind of point, pains they had, what kind of goals they had, etc. What made them happy, what made them sad, etc. And he conducted a lot of really great research from there. And now he's working as a really high position, I think like head of marketing or something for some logistics SaaS company, making really good money there, quit his job and, and is doing that. So works super well. And then the last thing is the lazy way that everyone wants to do. They go to chat GPT, they go to look at articles, they Google, what is the biggest pain of a logistics company? They ask chat GPT and chat GPT gives you a fucking bullshit answer because how would it know? You know, it's chat GPT isn't a logistics company, you know? So as you can see, the best and most accurate way of doing market research is talking to your already paying customer, customers. The reason for this is super simple. They are already paying you money, AKA, and this means they have a high level of trust in you, you know, like if they didn't trust you, they wouldn't be paying you money. You've also probably been able to build a deeper relationship with them over the time of working together. Also, since they are already paying you, it's a great indicator. It's a great indication that they are the exact company person who you are writing your copy for, buyers people in your niche who are buying fucking solutions, you know, like if you have a client and you're making landing pages for them or doing fucking media buying for them, like <laughs> they are the type of company who you're running your copy for. Fucking people, companies in your niche who can afford your prices and who are looking to fucking hire media buyers. So they are going to give you the best insights. So if you have the possibility to talk to your already paying customers, fucking do that. That's like super fire. If you don't, Talk to, the, talk to people in the market you could work with, but who are not paying you already. So then you go to do prospect interviews. So then you just reach out to the different people in the market and you ask them, hey, can I interview you? We're doing this research on this thing, on this topic, on the, in this industry. Can I ask you a few questions? I saw you're a clear expert. I would really value your opinion in exchange of your time. I can give you money or whatever, you know, like don't complicate this. Like. Customer interviews, I'm gonna show you a second in a second, like an email template how to book this. But if you go to like prospect interviews, literally just call them or email them, ask them if you can interview them. Like super fucking simple, you know? And uh, uh, the same goes for network interviews. But like, to be honest, like if you don't have some crazy reason why you can't do this t uh, top two, like don't do anything else here. Just do the top two, you know, they're better than anything else, like by far. Um, Research objective. So when we are doing this research and when we are talking to the market, our research ob objective is to identify specific events, mindsets, pain points, and desires that trigger the surge for a solution like ours. Understanding these triggers can help tailor marketing messages to resonate with the potential customer at the right moment. You know, we want to know why the fuck would they care about our solution. And you could break this down in the following areas. What is their mindset before buy buying? What are their pains before buying? What are their desires before buying? Path to discovering the product and point at which they bought the product. So if you are talking to your customer who has bought 
fucking media buying service or lead generation services from you. Okay, what was your mindset before that? What pains did you have before working with us? What goals did you have before working with us? How did you find out about us? And why did you buy it in the first place? Why did you buy from us? Now you have the top level overview of these areas. You can start to build questions that help to identify everything needed for your data set. And here's a few examples. For example, if you look at the pain, pains before buying, what were you doing to track your team's metrics in the past? And this is an example that I brought in. Let's say you are selling a uh, uh, product that helps to automate tracking of sales metrics. You know, so that, this is like an example that we used here or that I used here. So if you were selling, for example, that you could be asking, hey, what were you doing to track your team's metric in the past? Pain. How much time are you spending on this? Again, pain. How did you feel to do this every day? Their mindset. Were there any other tools that you considered or tried? How they found you, the path. Why did you want to track your team's metrics? Pain. When did you first hear about us? Path. How they found you. How many times did you hear about the tool? Path. Was there anything in particular that you found most attractive? Point. Why they bought from you. What are your initial impressions of the tool? Point. Was there anything that you pushed you to make a decision? Point. What did you imagine a day-to-day -day life, to, life to look like with the tool? Point. So pretty much these are the things that you want to figure out. And you can map it out based on your own service. So let's say you're selling B2B lead generation services. Okay, hey, how were you doing lead generation in the past? How much time or money were you spending on this? How did it make you feel to do this every day? Were there any other lead generation solutions you considered or tried before working with us? Why did you want to get more leads? How did you first hear about us? How, uh, like, how many times did you hear about us before fucking buying? Was there anything in particular that you found most attractive about their lead generation offer? What were your initial impressions of working with us? Was there anything that you pushed to make a decision? What did you imagine your day to, life, day, to day life to look like when working with us, when we were doing your lead generation, you know? One of the key tips to avoid bringing a huge monologue of questions to interview, like, uh, one of the key tips is to avoid bringing a huge monologue of questions to the interview itself. In doing this, you'll spend your time in the interview focusing on the next question in the list rather than listening to and pushing further on what your customers are currently talking about. So when you are talking to your customer, don't focus on what are all the questions you want to ask. Focus on the depth of answers. You know, if they tell you, hey, we wanted to get, we, like you ask them, hey, why did you want to get more leads? And they're like, ah, oh, we wanted to grow the company. Okay, why? Why did you want to grow the company? Because of X, Y, and Okay, why does that matter? Why did you think that generating leads would be um, would be better to do this? So it's like better to go as deep as possible on these questions and get to like the actual root um, root of the question or root of the answer instead of just trying to ask a million questions. But all of those questions are fucking shallow and the, all the answers are shit because that's not going to help anything. You know, like if you get to know like one rule problem, they're like, hey, why did you want to grow the company? Because... Uh, I wanted to have more profit. Why did you want to have more profit? So I can take home more salary. Okay, why did you want more salary? Because my kids are going to school in a few years and I need to fucking pay for college. Okay, how did that make you feel? Did, why did you think that lead generation is going to help you do that? Boom, 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 you know? To solve this problem, take a list of questions that you have created and convert them into a combination of core topics with notes to help you touch on those questions if you get lost. So for example, like something like this, before you're in the product, what was life looking like and what were your primary struggles? And then you can have some like additional questions. For example, how was their tracking, how was uh, tracking done in the past? How much time did it take? How did it feel? How did you track your team metrics, etc., etc., etc. So these are just like easy bullet points that you can look over during the interview and be like, okay, shit, this is what I need to ask. And make sure that you record the interviews so you can go back on them and you don't have to spend the whole whole meeting just taking a bunch of notes. Of course, this is a completely theoretical example, but it gives a general overview as to how the process will look. The more time you spend creating and perfecting your questions, the better and more consistent the data will be in the outcome. Like if you just go and you ask everyone fucking different questions and all of the questions are formatted differently, and in some of the interviews you dig super deep, in some interviews you don't, like, let's say you do 10, 15, 20 interviews with your clients or prospects, like, oh, the data is going to be all messed up. You won't, like, you will be smarter, but it's going to be harder to make any decision based on it. So you might be thinking, okay, why would my customers or clients bother to do this? I don't want to be annoying. And it's 100% a fair point. And one of the trickiest parts about doing these customer interviews and doing this research, you've done a bunch of work and to build your research objective and your questions. But if nobody wants to talk to you, it is all pretty much for nothing. So there are multiple ways that you can uh, approach this, but a lot of it boils down to the point of contact. In almost every case, you'll be sending your customer an email or a Slack message, and this email or Slack message is a make or break, so don't half-ass it. The initial email should be clearly uh, should clearly identify the ask, 
squash any concerns about being sold to and provide any incentive required and we will also get to that later and it might look something like this hey john firstly congratulations on the recent acquisition we are conducting a research project amongst our top customers with that in mind your insights would be incredibly valuable it's a casual 45 minute conversation about your experience with product or solution over google meet or zoom if you prefer purely research you will not be sold anything and your time is valuable, so no worries if not. But we would be we would be happy to offer you a hundred dollar Amazon gift card in return for your time. If you're open to the idea, here's a link to book a time. I'll send you a gift voucher to the same email, calendar link. Boom. And some people are gonna think, holy shit, like I don't wanna pay money, I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna like you don't have to. If you have a good relationship, you don't have to. But remember that this data and this information and learning this stuff is pretty much what separates you from being top one percent cold email copywriter. The first line will be some kind of personalization. Of course, this is completely dependent on your relationship with the prospect, but as you can see, the general aims to be transparent, conversational, and lighthearted. Send four follow-ups to these emails in case they do not reply or book in. Once again, depends a lot on your client relationship. And make sure these follow a similar structure and include personalization elements. And uh, I would recommend creating a separate labeling system in your CRM so you can see who you have actually reached out to and if you have interviewed with them already etc etc et so when should I incentivize and when should I not and if I do how much should I pay so should you be giving $100 Amazon gift cards for everyone or not entirely dependent on your relationship with the customer if you have a very close relationship and work together consistently probably no need to do that and they would be really willing to help you out without a need for an incentive but if your customer doesn't have any idea who you are personally you'll likely need to provide some kind of incentive as you don't have any goodwill according to a study for most b2b situations the incentive should be six to 120 dollars for up to one hour interview and of course if you're dealing with very senior positions this might be higher a good rule of thumb is to base it on the hourly contact rate of the individual. Don't get too caught up thinking what the incentive should be. Vouchers are always good, uh, but here are some other alternatives. You can discounts of your service, a physical gift of value or whatever, you know, like let's say you're doing a B2B lead generation and say, hey, the first, uh, and you're charging them based on the leads that you generate. Hey, I'll give you the next three leads for free. And that might be worth $500. So that's like a huge incentive, like that's fucking great, but it doesn't really cost you that much. So that's absolutely fantastic. So step number one to do this correctly and actually become top 1% copywriter is just talk to the market and gather information. If you can, talk to your already existing clients or customers. If you can't, talk to other people in the market, call them, send them an email. Hey, John, we are doing research on this topic in this niche. I saw that you're a clear expert and you probably know a lot about the industry based on your work history. Hey, if I can take 50 minutes of her time next Tuesday, would absolutely love to. I'll give you a hundred dollar gift card. Boom, 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 boom. Send a thousand of those emails out or two thousand or five thousand if you need to. And you'll for sure get 10 to 15 interviews. I think 10 to 15 is a pretty good minimum. Uh, but if you can go super deep with like three or four of your clients, that's usually even like, like one is better than zero. Like, but uh, in most cases, the depth matters a lot. And of course, we want to get a good average. So we don't want to be interviewing just one person because they might be a complete outlier in your scenario. Step two, you want to extract the right information from your conversations and research. No, So now after doing a bunch of interviews and research, you'll be left with a lot of unorganized notes, core recordings and ideas. And it's super important that we organize this information into a simple database that we can use for copywriting. And I'm going to give you a sheet that you can use to do this. Go through all your call recordings and notes and fill the sheet out. And uh, I'll show you what the sheet looks like. Boom, 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 boom. This is pretty much what it looks like. Super simple. So here, just go line by line and you just add things. What is the niche? So what is their industry? What is their vertical, etc. Their geolocation. What are the target market characteristics? So their location, their experience, their headcount, blah, 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 blah. Their current metrics related to their solutions. So maybe if you sell a B2B lead generation service, you could write... Mm, doing co like mm, getting five leads a month from cold email shit what am i doing here um and then you could be saying um, 50 to hundred thousand dollars a month in revenue and maybe you say fucking three to five, three to five SDRs, etc. Like you're just pretty much like taking the averages. Let's say you interview 10 people, you'll get like a really average set. Like, okay, from then 10 of these people, eight people were between 
50 to 100k, boom. Seven people had three to five SDRs, boom. So you can like extrapolate the averages here because we don't need to have like specifics of every single person, but we just need some kind of average view of what does your average customer look like. Customer pain points, what common problems they face, and what they wish to achieve or resolve. So what kind of desires they have, what kind of beliefs they have. Like if someone, if your niche generally believes that cold email doesn't work and you're trying to sell cold email solutions, it's pretty important data point to have. Top fears and concerns, what are they afraid of happening? Failures, what have they failed at trying to solve this problem? So let's say you sell a lead generation solution once again, maybe they have tried ads, maybe they have tried SEO, maybe they have tried hiring SDRs, blah, 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 blah. Trends and factors affecting their industry, top influencers or thought leaders they follow, software apps or tools frequently used, personal goals and business goals, what worries them the most relation to your solution, like maybe they are afraid of GDPR laws or whatever the fuck. Um, what led them to buying your solution? How did they discover your product? What are the most common job titles you see in this niche when talking about this? What kind of company size are you talking to? Education level or any relevant certifications of these people? Values and motives uh, or values and what motivates them in business? And non-work related interests and hobbies are also really good things because then you can uh, be more general or more specific with them. But yeah, just like fill this out based on uh, other interviews that you've done and uh, you will be able to get this uh, in the description, the shit. Uh, but yeah, so go through all your core contents and notes and fill the shit out. I also recommend highlighting the accuracy and relevancy of different data points. Some things are mentioned, uh, some things that are mentioned are more often, or some things are mentioned more often or clearly are more important. So maybe everyone tells you, yeah, bro, our biggest pain point is like fucking dealing with these SDRs that are like not just doing well and it's hard to manage them. Like everyone tells that and it's like really clear that they have a lot of pain. Like fucking highlight that like marketing red on the sheet. Like SDRs are a pain. And uh, some things you're not 100% sure about and we're only mentioned quickly by one or two people. So someone says, yeah, and of course, like it's like super fucking painful to try to do SEO, but no one else says it. It's like still good to put it there, like into the sheet. It might be valuable. It might be super good, but there's a reason why not many people mentioned it. And make, you, make sure you mark these things down. So remember, not all data is equal. After that, when you've done that and you have to fill sheet, we go into step number three, which is implementing it to your campaigns. Now, all the hard work is done and it's time to make some fucking money. If you've done everything correctly, you should have a worksheet describing your customer's current situations, beliefs, desires, past failures, fears, and everything else important about your prospects. Let's imagine that the ICP you were targeting was sales leaders in companies with over 40 sales reps in the US and you were selling a product that automates the tracking of sales data. So pretty much if you remember the interview questions that I had as an example, then let's say we were selling the same thing. We have a, like a software product that automates the tracking of sales data. Now we can transform your messaging entirely from a generic problem statement in your outbound Messaging like, hey, are you currently automating your tracking process? Like a lot of people would like, hey, are you currently automating your tracking process? And instead of that, you can say, typically we find that sales leaders in companies similar to whatever company you're reaching out to are spending between one to three hours a day manually tracking their sales reps and then importing it into Hubs HubSpot. This often leads to them using AI or trying to take shortcuts, leaving the data inaccuracies. Is this familiar? And this is like, maybe like everyone has said, it takes between one to five hours. They do it every day manually and they import, uh, they, they use HubSpot. Um, like maybe you see like eight out of 10 of your clients use HubSpot. They try to like, they mention like what they try to do to solve this. You're able to call this out. Hey, like you're suffering from this pain. You're using this tool. You're trying to do this shortcut or you're trying to do this solution, but it leads to this problem, you know, like as this messaging is based on research, it becomes an incredibly powerful sales messaging trigger and they will get that same feeling that you get when an advertisement pops up on Instagram and you think, how did they know this? Is my phone listening to me? Like when you do this correctly, it's like, how the fuck did they know this? Like, do they know me personally? How did they know that I spend two hours every day doing this? How did they know I import all the prospects to HubSpot? How did they know that I tried to do AI, but I had the problem with data inaccuracy? Like, how did they fucking know? It's the same thing. Like when you get an ad about dog toys, like 30 minutes <laughs> after you have talked about getting a dog, it's like, you'll get the same feeling or prospects, like fucking powerful as hell. And step four is iterated based on feedback and new insights. So this is super important because a big mistake that most marketers make is that they go through this process once and keep using the same data for years. 
Remember, markets mature, new solutions come to the market, and people develop different beliefs over time. It's extremely important that you keep this document dynamic, the worksheet that I just gave you. Every single time when you talk to your prospects, customers, or people in the industry, keep your ears open for any of these data points. If you gain new insights, go back and update this document, this worksheet here, like go back and fucking update this every single day, you know? Or like every single time when you learn something new. Um, I recommend doing it on a weekly basis. Also, as you're running campaigns and testing different things, you'll find out that some things are more impactful than others. In these cases, make sure you go back to documents, uh, go back and document these findings in your sheet as well. So maybe you got like three big pain points from all the customer interviews. You use all of them for a cold email campaign, but one of them didn't work at all. Then you can go to your document and write, try this, didn't really work, maybe not accurate, you know? And as long as you're writing the copy correctly and doing this interview process correctly, this creates an amazing flywheel effect. Like you do market research to make your copy more relevant. Your campaigns perform better because your copy is more relevant. You book more calls and get more clients because once again, the campaigns perform better. And from these calls and these clients, you get even more insights in your market, which means that you can write even more relevant copy, which means you get even more clients, which gives you even more insights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a really great flywheel as long as you just keep doing it. So to summarize, when you truly understand the deep desires of your prospects and communicate communicated it to them, you'll be able to write extremely relevant copy, book more meetings, get rid of all the fancy cold email templates and stand out from your competitors. Because if all your competitors are doing generic bullshit emails, it's like, and you do something that like feels like you're reading their mind and you know them personally, they're going to be like, holy shit, like these guys, they know what they are talking about. They know my problems. They understand me. I trust them. I don't trust any of these other generic clowns. Don't take this process lightly because the big difference between all the best copywriters and marketers in the world is the fact that they understand who they are talking to on a really deep level. There is nothing more relevant or higher leverage than doing this correctly. So either you can do it or you don't, but if you don't, you're going to be lapped by our campaigns because we are just more relevant than yours. <laughs> Boom. Like the video, subscribe, whatever. Take care. Bye.